Hey, Village Church, Pastor Mark here. We are so glad that you are part of our church globally, wherever you're watching this, tuning in, gathering in community groups, giving, being part of the mission. We're so glad that you're actually part of Village Church. And... Today, we are starting something brand new, the Gospel of John, and we're doing three weeks on what his scholars have called the prologue, which is the first 18 verses of the book. There are some of the most amazing, unreal verses in the whole Bible. Let me start off by saying happy Movember to you. If you've noticed, I got a little thing on my face, and my, the reason I have it is because my daughters say it looks terrible. And so that's all the motivation a father needs to be like, I'm going to grow this thing out as thick and beautiful and bristly as possible and see where this thing goes. And so hopefully you like it. If you don't, I don't care, uh, man, but we're glad you're here. And you know what? And to be honest, Movember is very interesting because it brings attention to men's health, uh, prostate cancer, and, uh, and even uh, men's suicide and how... Suicide is actually one of the leading reasons that men pass away before the average lifespan of a man in the Western world, which is actually not that far off than the subject of the gospel of John, the first 18 verses, because oftentimes that happens in people's lives because we're in a dark place. We're depressed. We're going through difficulty in life. And John is going to introduce us to the light that breaks through the darkness of our lives of our world, of our confusion, of the pain and isolation. And he is going to tell us about the one who brings life into the darkness. And it, it becomes a question about whether you and I embrace that to give us the kind of hope that oftentimes dark places, we don't have any hope. We don't have any understanding of our meaning and purpose and reason for existence. And Jesus in a very special way, and maybe you don't know him as you're watching this, brings that in a way you can't even imagine. He brought it into my life when I was 17 years old. And honestly, if you would have walked up to me uh, when I was in high school and said that I needed something, I wouldn't have even known what I needed. See, we don't know what we don't know. And the reality is I would have been fine just living my life the way I wanted to live my life, but I was in a bad place. And it's only when you come into the light that you begin to look backward to the dark place you were, not even realizing the kind of life, as John is going to tell us, that this person Jesus Christ brings in to our lives. So we're going to do something over the next three weeks that's a little more technical. We're going to do the prologue, which is the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. And then we're going to do three weeks of Advent that then lead into Christmas Eve, which is, of course, the, the, the whole celebration of, of God becoming a human being in the person of Jesus and bringing peace and love and joy into the world. And then in the new year in January, we are going to full launch into the rest of the Gospel of John and it's going to be awesome. So in this prologue piece, though, we're going to do something a little more technical. Uh, we're going to focus in on these verses, almost like these are like lectures uh, versus sermons, because some of the language is so technical that we actually need to hone in on them and go, okay, how does this work? And, and the reason uh, scholars call this section of scripture, if you've got a Bible, make sure you have it, John chapter 1. Um, they call it the prologue because they're trying to say that these are the 18 verses before John launches into his narrative, which is a great, I mean, honestly, the gospel of John, why it's going to be so beautiful to do it as a church is because it's very different than all the other gospels. So it tells like almost none of the same stories that the other gospels tell. So if you're worried, you're like, we we're in Matthew for three years. Now we're going to do John is completely different than Matthew it tells almost none of the same stories completely different vibe, way more like theological, esoteric, mystical, gets into the reason behind. Let me explain things to you theologically. Let me extrapolate. Let me, you know, get into your spiritual life constantly. And so it's got psychology and philosophy and theology and history and all these beautiful things that actually come down to apply to everything to do with our life. So it's a beautiful, fun, unreal book. To be honest with you, if it became illegal to own a Bible, and I could only get one book to go away with for the rest of my life, I would make it the Gospel of John. That's how meaningful it is. And it's probably been the central book in the context of the church, certainly even these 18 verses for theology that the church has established throughout the years. But of course, this is the prologue, the first 18 verses before the book begins. And um, the reason it's, it's like Romeo and Juliet, right? When you read Romeo and Juliet, how does it start? Shakespeare starts it and he says, two households, 
both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean, yada, 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 two star-crossed lovers take their lives. What is he doing? He's coming out of the gate and he's telling us right off the bat, you're not gonna be surprised when Romeo and Juliet kill themselves at the end. And if you haven't you know, read the book, I'm sorry to ruin the ending for you. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet kill themselves at the end. But Shakespeare tells us right off the bat, the first thing you read, the first thing you watch when it's a play, uh, it's a prologue. Uh, or uh, Star Wars, for those of you who may not be reading Shakespeare as much, you know, the opening crawl, like, you know, and, and you read, you know, Luke Skywalker is missing, you know, the empire is falling apart. That's a prologue. It's like, you're going to enter into this story, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of stuff before you get into it. And so this is where we are with these 18 verses. And this, what, what's about to be explained in these verses is what J.I. Packer calls the ultimate scandal. He says, the ultimate scandal of Christianity is not necessarily the Good Friday message of atonement or the Easter Sunday message of resurrection. It's the Christmas message of the incarnation, which is what these 18 verses get into. It's that God incarnate, it means like coming into meat. Um, God becomes a human being and, and John is gonna tell us that story and he's gonna tell us who it is that we're actually looking at and looking for. And this defines everything to do with everyone who, the fate of everyone who's ever lived is in these verses. This is the most important central fact of history. He comes right out off the beginning and he says, look, like, like if you have any interest in Jesus or your own life, these verses are everything because it's, you know, Madonna uh, can wear a t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy. But that's to misunderstand the prologue of John because Jesus ain't your homeboy. Jesus is either nothing and just another guy who walked around or he's what the prologue says he is. He, he's not your homeboy, Madonna. He made you, if you're watching this, ding, right? He, he's your creator, if the prologue's true, which changes everything. And you're watching this, it changes everything to do with the way you're gonna wake up tomorrow. This is not just an academic exercise. We're gonna do some academia a little bit, all right? Some of you, you gotta get your coffee out, you gotta have your Bible out because we're gonna get technical once in a while, but then I'll come out of the technical and try to make it live and breathe for us. How does all of this start? The most beautiful, in my opinion, book in the New Testament. How does it start? Here we go. John opens up his gospel and tells us something amazing. In the beginning in the beginning. What does that echo for you? Now, if you're um, a, I mean, it's interesting. I was, uh, I mean, thinking about the fact that this very phrase, how he opens his whole book. I mean, we're on holy ground here, guys. This is like, I was in a lineup this morning with a, with a, a, a John commentary under my arm. And I was just about to sit down for breakfast. And a guy looks at me and he goes, New Testament scholar, eh? And I'm like, um, yeah. I said, no, I'm actually a pastor. Uh, and he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, um, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting John today. And he said, ooh, heavy waters. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you're doing the prologue? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you're gonna get it all done? I'm like, no, clearly you don't know me. I'm lucky if we get three verses done today, to be honest. But this is the heaviest stuff. And in the beginning are the words of what? If you're a Jew, see, this is interesting. As Canadians, you and I kind of walk around and we don't click into this. We're like, yeah, sure, in the beginning. I guess he's just telling us a story about the start of something. Um, and we need to be able to make a shift in our lives to understand the New Testament wasn't written as a 21st century document to Canadians or if you're watching from America or Central America or uh, Amsterdam or wherever you're watching this from, um, it wasn't written in your context. It was written in a particular context. And I, and I remember in college, I understood this for the first time and I started reading the New Testament and I actually, it became alive to me and far more compelling and interesting and I didn't even understand what that context of that world was. But when I started studying the context of first century Judaism, Jesus became alive in a way that I never understood before. 
and I remember I wrote this paper of, I've told you guys this before, but it almost set the tone for my, the rest of my life where a professor gave the paper back and said, I want you to get up and teach a lecture on the paper that you wrote two weeks from now for an hour and a half because the stuff you saw in that text, it changed kind of the meaning of the text even for me. And, and I think it was your, and what was it? It was the study when I started understanding first century Judaism, I started seeing the text differently. And this is what we begin to understand. Once we immerse ourselves in the story that Jesus actually walked into, we start to understand Jesus wasn't some 21st century revolutionary or social justice warrior or, or farmer out there. He was a first century century Jew who had a context. So why does he, when he walks around, he gets 12 disciples. You and I read it and we're like, I don't know, 12, one more than 11, one less than 13. In their world, 12 was how many tribes of Israel there were. And so Jesus is literally walking around and he's reconstituting Israel around himself when he goes into baptism and he gets up through the waters of baptism and then he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he fights Satan. What's that about? We read it, we're like, I don't know, he's just kind of figuring stuff out. He goes in. What happened? What was the most definitive story in Israel's history? They came through the waters of the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness, not for 40 days, but for 40 years. And there they fought Satan. And you read Matthew's gospel. And every time Jesus is fighting Satan in the wilderness, he cites a Bible passage from Deuteronomy, which is the story of Israel in the wilderness during the Red Sea debacle. So here we have Jesus being Israel in himself, and he's reconstituting Israel. See, this is the backdrop. It's the piano that's playing. That if you don't understand it, you misunderstand the Bible, and you misunderstand God, and you misunderstand who Jesus is and what he was saying. And this is what John is going to elevate for us in a way we never could have understood before. He's going to show us a kind of an aside of Jesus that you've never even thought of. It's going to change your life. And so right here off the beginning, we see in the beginning... And, he, and we got to understand, he's not just telling a story here. He's actually giving us Genesis. Those are the opening words of the book of Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. That's Genesis one. It was like the most definitive text in their world. And here's John saying, in the beginning, I'm giving you a creation story. But not only am I giving you a creation story, I'm giving you a new creation story. I'm gonna tell you the story of the dawn of a new world. You have all these, you see the evil and the pain among you. You see the disaster. You see the isolation. You see the difficulty of people's lives. That's the creation story of where it went. But I'm about to tell you how, who is going to reverse all of that pain and bring about a new creation. I'm going to tell you the story of, of the man who came to birth a new world and how you can get into it. That's the story I'm about to tell you. It's a new Genesis. This is what is in John's mind when he starts to write the prologue and he wants to introduce us and he wants to say, I'm giving you new creation. I'm giving you the one who took all the sin and the evil and the pain of the world that came after creation. There was creation and then there was the fall. I'm telling you the story of the one who's reversing all the effects of the fall in the world and bringing about the kingdom. See, here's what we got to understand. Some of us misunderstand this. More has happened in the person and the work of Jesus than we think. He brought about a new world. We sit around and we mope and complain. We're like, oh, the world's so evil. The world's so bad. What are we going to do? The New Testament's going, I'm giving giving you new creation. There was someone who came and dealt with the pain. Now there's a, there's a dawning of the kingdom among us. There is life. There is freedom. There is light. There is salvation. Satan has been defeated. Sin has been vanquished. Jesus Christ came and actually did something. And we're sitting around waiting for what he came Paul says in 1 Corinthians that all the promises of God are yes in him. And we're going, yeah, but what about the land? It's like, he created a new creation. And what are we doing about it? 
Do we recognize? This is why he gave us the task. What did he say right in the middle of the Lord's prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the people when we believe in Jesus to bring about the kingdom and new creation in the present. We're the, we're the little you know, piece of grass that's growing up through the concrete of the old world in the now, in the present, no more waiting. Yes, of course there will be, and I'll talk about this in a second, there's, there's going going to be an ultimate heaven and earth where all the pain will be reversed, of course. But now we are called to be the people, the people who believe in him, to be that grass coming up through the concrete in the present time, reflecting out into the world. We're supposed to work for it. So you're going to be someone who says you're against abortion, for instance. Okay, great. Do you do anything to help young women who do get pregnant and need the support of somebody or do you just condemn it from afar? You see, the church is the people who represent new creation in the present and say there's a better way. This is what Jesus has called us to be. You watch uh, the end of The Dark Knight Rises, which is probably the worst of the three of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. But at the end, you know the story that, that Bruce Wayne as a little kid, both his parents were shot and killed and... And it's Commissioner Gordon, when he's a little kid, who, who, who puts his coat around him in his office and, and, and takes care of him. And right at the end of The Dark Knight Rises, Gordon doesn't know who Batman is. He doesn't know it's the little kid. And Bruce Wayne, uh, and, and Batman says something like, a hero is, 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 is anybody who wraps their coat around a kid to let him know that the world is not ended. The church are the people who do the thing that's, that's bringing about the new creation in the world. And so you see rape and war and death and disease. Yes, Genesis was about the creation of people. This book is about the recreation of people and it's about the recreation of you too. The unfolding of this story is about your life because yes, there is the the already arrived kingdom and it's beautiful and it's unreal and it can offer you salvation in ways you could never know. But there's also this reality. There's the fact that it hasn't come in its fullness yet. What scholars call the not yet kingdom. And it's true about you. There's, there's still evil. There's still pain and it's still true about you. So don't be, I was sitting with someone recently and they're like, I don't get why I still sin. I don't get why I still keep going back to this sin in my life. And you got to have grace in yourself because this new creation hasn't come in its fullness yet. Yes, in the beginning speaks of creation and new creation offers a hope. And that's what you got to hold on to in the midst of the struggle, bro. Like this is what I was telling the guy. He's like, I can't believe I just keep going back to the sin again and again and again. Listen, Sometimes the thing that's going to, see, this is what discipleship is. It's like sometimes the solution to the problems and the pain and the tension of your life is not going to be, you know, deliverance. It's not going to be a moment where you show up at church and a guy in a suit dressed like an alien puts his hand on your head and all of a sudden all your problems go away. The New Testament says that's not what probably is going to be your experience. Your experience is going to be discipleship. Not deliverance necessarily. Yes, there'll be moments of deliverance, of course, but it's the long grinding game of self-mastery where Jesus Christ is your pre present with you in the midst of the tension and the struggle. And as he's gonna say in the gospel of John, he gives you somebody to help you along. The Holy Spirit outside of your own experience, outside of the experience of this world the spirit comes in to give you hope in the midst of the darkness of your life. And so there is the not yet kingdom. Of course, there is our life and the tension that we live in. And then John says, beyond this kind of pregnant phrase in the beginning where you have creation and new creation, the next thing he says has been debated by theologians for centuries. He says, he, in the beginning was the word. This, this word is a, is a fascinating word. It's actually a Greek word, logos, right? And logos is, um, th there's a couple meanings to this. So the first meaning to it is um, in, in, the, in the Bible, God actually speaks. You remember the creation story. He speaks light 
into darkness and he speaks um, uh, into creation of animals and and people, and he, say, he said, he said, he said. And so there's the power of the words. And then in Proverbs 8, you have this word like logos, uh, word or wisdom is part of the creation narrative over and over and over again. But, but there's also a background of pagan ideas. Uh, there was a uh, religion called Gnosticism at the time. And, and gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. And so Gnosticism is a religion where it talks about having a special knowledge. And uh, it talks about the idea that, that reason or logic is the thing that holds together the universe. And so Zeus was called the orthos logos, the right reason. In 500 BC, there was a philosopher that talked about the idea that the universe was held together by, by uh, logic, by reason, by the logos, by certain laws of physics and mathematics and morality. We know that, right? Like, like we know for the Big Bang to have worked, uh, there had to be laws of physics that were in place to actually make the stars and the, and, and the planets proper properly go apart. Um, mathematics, we know that the, 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 that's a law stitched into the universe. Like two plus two equals four. It, it's never equals five. It can't by definition, but where, who, who creates, it, no one really sat down and created that. It's, it's a law. Um, Morality seems to be a law in some way. If you, if you look, and for those of you in our culture, of course, who debate that, that morality is just culturally constructed, notice those same people were, verily, uh, were very morally jacked up um, about the election. The, the same, you know, when we, when we do an election, people make decisions on who they vote for, not based on what they hope to be true and what they thought, but what is right. Where does that morality come from? Well, philosophers had already debated it, but Christianity says it comes because God stitched this consciousness into us, that there really is a ordering principle in the universe called logos, yes, and there was all kinds of debate during that time about what it was. Who is this? What is this logos, this principle? And John comes out and he says, I'll tell you who the, the logos is not a principle, it's a person. If you want true meaning, tr true, true uh, logic and reason to your life, I'm going to introduce you to the one who actually brings that. That's what he's trying to say. And so what I love about this is that literally there's a concept logos in pagan culture. And instead of just saying, well, oh, pagans, let me give you the truth. God comes and fulfills the idea that's already present in pagan culture versus just saying, oh, away with you. This is the, the, the conversation that C.S. Lewis and, and J.R.R. Tolkien had years ago where Lewis was looking into all of the pagan stories that preexisted the person and work of Jesus. And, and he was struggling with why there were some parallels to, to stories that actually existed before Christianity, that why Jesus was kind of similar to some of these gods that were talked about, Horus and Mithras and Dionysus and Addis and whatever. And then he came to understand through conversations with Tolkien that he ended up saying, why wouldn't there be parallels? Because God stitches kind of a cruciform pattern stitched into history that then he comes himself and fulfills. And so it's myth become fact, he says. This is the beautiful, this is what John is trying to say. He's like, yes, there was this discussion of the logos. There was this discussion of the reason and the rationale and the thing that holds everything together. And I'm gonna tell you who it is. It's the person of Jesus. And why that's important, he's gonna tell us his name in, in a few verses, but why that's important is because if there's no logic and reason and meaning to history, then there's no logic and reason and meaning to your life, which leads nothing to depression, anxiety, pain, restlessness, lawlessness, the kind of stuff that secularism has produced in our life and in our culture and in our cities. Because if there is no telos, the Greek word for end or goal, then there's no meaning to your life at all. So no wonder we are hopeless and helpless and aimless. You wanna talk about why men go off the rails in large numbers, aimlessness. There's no logic to their life, 
There's no reason holding it together. There's no purpose. There's no aim. And yet John comes and he says, guys, you can't deal with the weight and the burden of the secular story, which is this, you're your own savior. Speaking of Christopher Nolan, his stories are the most humanist story. Like if you go watch the movie Interstellar, Interstellar is this movie where the, the, the earth is kind of getting destroyed and they need to figure out a solution. And so these people find a black hole and they keep saying, well, they sent it here. They put it here so that we could go through the black hole and survive as humanity. And everyone through the whole movie is like, who, who's they, who's they, who sent it here? And, and for the movie, you're kind of like, well, aliens must have, or somebody, but, and then at the end of the movie, you find through crazy philosophy and four dimensional, five dimensional space and you know, things that all quarks and dark matter and whatever, that we put it there ourselves because we figured out how to crunch time and gravity and move between space. The point is this, we saved ourselves. Humankind is humankind's own savior. And it, oh, what a great idea. And it's idealist. And it ends up burdening us to the point where we can't even function anymore because we have no aim, no hope. As N.T. Wright has said, if it's true, even that, that new age philosophy is true. You know, new age philosophy says that there's, a, there's part of divinity in everything. And he says, if there's part of the divine in everything, like some worldviews talk about, maybe you hold that worldview right now, that, that God is in everything and, and human beings even are kind of little divine entities. N.T. Wright points out that if there's, if there's divinity in everything, then there's divinity in hurricanes and cancer cells, and we're in a prism in which we cannot save ourselves. But Christianity comes along and says, of course, the hope is that we get saved from without the logic, the, the reason, the meaning, the purpose, the direction is God himself in a way that you might not even understand yet. And so um, he says, uh, one writer has said, the solution to the riddle of life in space and time lies outside space and time. And so this word was the word, whoever it is, uh, this word, he says, is God. So he says, in the beginning was the word and the word, uh, and the word was with God and the word was God, twice. And so he's trying to say it's God. And in the Greek, it's actual order here is, is God is the word, is actually the order. Because what John's trying to say is he's not just rethinking Jesus, he's rethinking God. And so some of you out there, you have a concept of God right now and you use that word in a particular way and the gospel of John is gonna be, is gonna be 21 chapters of going, you have it wrong. You're not using the word right. Whatever you mean, I'm gonna, that literally theos, um, logos, like God is the word. He's trying to say, I'm not just gonna redefine Jesus for you, I'm gonna redefine, get you to rethink the meaning of God himself and that's the point. And so he starts to hint here. And so the, there's the hint of, of the New Testament theology of, uh, of Trinitarian thought or the Trinity, that God is one, but he's also three. And that's why you have here this fascinating phrase that he's with God. And so the word is God, but he's also with God. And so one writer has said this, the word does not by himself make up the entire Godhead. Nevertheless, the divinity that belongs to the rest of the Godhead, which we find out is Father and Holy Spirit as well, belongs also to him. So Christianity is always taught equally one, eternally one, eternally distinct. So in this text alone, we get the when of the word, the where of the word, and the who of the word. So, so let me just come back to that in a second, because these are the deep waters that Christianity offers the world that starts to stretch the brain. But there was another part of Gnosticism that was interesting as a religion at the time. And of course, that's the context that John's writing into. Every scholar, you read any commentary on the gospel of John, they say, John is writing to Gnostics, which we might go, oh, Gnostics, that word's boring. I'm, you know, listen, it's fascinating 
how there is a modern version of Gnosticism today. And here's what I mean. And, and, and cultural critics are talking about this now more than ever in 2020. You know what Gnosticism was? Gnosticism was the theology and philosophy that you could get a special knowledge and you would get salvation through that special knowledge. Today, we have conspiracy theories of people who live their life in such a way they're almost defined by saying, I have a secret knowledge that defines my life. I know what nobody else knows. I know that there is a group of people in existence, evil people, sitting somewhere, controlling everything, twisting their mustaches, trying to destroy the world. And that gives me an understanding of meaning and comfort because at least I know there's a group of evil people and a group of good people. Listen to the people as they talk right now, as they scroll social media and see. I was listening to uh, Joe Rogan the other day and he was talking about aliens and talking about the fact that he thinks they're traveling interdimensionally and, and how they work and these aliens and how drugs and, he, and, and dr drugs are great and he, he promotes doing drugs because it enters you in a different state of consciousness. It opens up your mind to, to explore new ideas that you would never have if you didn't take these drugs. All of this stuff, what is this? This is a kind of special knowledge that's gonna save you, that's gonna make you unique, that's gonna make you look smarter than everybody else. This is what John writes into. And he says, there is a knowledge. And you know what's really important? And this is where the gospel of John's gonna go. You look at John 17 and, and throughout the series, you're gonna need a Bible. John 17, Jesus says in verse three, he defines salvation like this. It's fascinating. And this is eternal life that they know you and the only, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That word know is the word gnosis, to know. And so John constantly has Jesus talking about what you know and what you don't know, the knowledge that defines your life. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean you go to church, you know, every week. It doesn't mean that you give to, it doesn't mean that you went to, you grew up in the church. It doesn't mean a Bible study every week. It doesn't mean these things because there's a version where you know about God. And then there's a version of your life where you actually know him. And that's different. I know a lot about Tiger Woods, a lot. I could see him in a coffee shop. I'd tell you every stat he's got. He doesn't know me though. And that's the problem. You could know a lot about God and him not know you. Remember that terrifying text in Matthew 7? I cast out demons in your name. I did ministry. I sang songs away from me. Away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. And yet Jesus here in John 17 says, defines eternal life as they know us. And so Genesis begins with eternal doing, right? He made, he made, he made. John goes one better and goes, I'm gonna start with, with divine being. I'm gonna tell you who actually created. It's one thing to say, okay, 14 billion years ago, as the universe was coming, I, I can tell you there was a creator. It's another thing to go, I'm gonna tell you who it was. I'm gonna write you 18 verses and then 21 chapters telling you who it is. He gives us his name. If you go scroll down I mean, with your eyes to verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He gives us the name, which is a great verse for when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking on the door, by the way. I mean, all of these verses are great because the Jehovah's Witnesses forget verse 17 and 18, where he tells us the word, the word's name is Jesus. The one who was God is Jesus. And then he says in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And this is why we need, of course, the skeptics come along and they say, in the beginning, God created the universe. I mean, I don't really understand why we need to believe that because maybe the universe is the eternal thing that never actually ever began to exist. And of course, philosophers always said that, but we've understood over the last hundred years that that's not true. We know that the universe began to exist. And if the universe began to exist, it has to have a cause. And so you have to understand as an atheist that your worldview implies a math equation that you can't live your life on. Nobody 
times nothing equals everything is not how you define a life. The Bible comes along and says, in the beginning, time actually started. Time began. At a, God is outside of time. So nothing had to create God. There's no evidence that God ever began to exist. But time began when God created. A.W. Tozer says this, the mind looks backward in time until the dim past vanishes. Then looks into the future till thoughts and imagination collapse from exhaustion. And God is at both points unaffected by either. See, that's the idea. Skeptics want to come along and say, we have a, when did God begin to exist? Kids in the playground. Well, if God did, you know, God never began. To exist. That's a category mistake. It's like asking what color the, you know, red, what the color red smells like. I don't know. I'm just, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's the idea that you're asking the wrong question of a being that is by definition in his nature, eternal, all powerful, infinite but his creation isn't. And that's what the last hundred years has taught us that was different from thousands of years of philosophy because we didn't know if creation was eternal. See, the point is this, he's saying all of this happened because of this, the word, the, the logos. And, and, and let me give you an analogy for this word and how important it is. Um, think about words and how they work. And I think this is the level that John's talking. Think about if I wanna, if there's somebody I'm interested in and I wanna know what's going on secretly in their mind. What's gonna give me that information? If, they, if my wife just sits there and looks at me and I wanna know what's going on in that head of hers, if she doesn't use words, I'm hooped. It's only when she says, I, cause I'm like, what do you want for dinner? I just wanna make you happy, just tell me anything. The minute she says, rice, I'm like, okay, got it. I have the knowledge I need because the words are what in, bring you into the knowledge and the relationship that you need. My, uh, I, my our friends of ours and us were traveling a while ago and we went for, we booked uh, four massages. Now my massage philosophy is to completely just relax, right? I do a lot of talking in my life. I don't wanna to talk to anybody. So I go in, I know my philosophy and it may feel mean or whatever. And my philosophy is never show any interest to this person about to give you a massage. Cause the minute you do, you're sitting there for an hour and you are locked down, you are their prisoner and they're gonna talk. So we went away, three ladies came out and me and the two ladies were, or the two ladies, me and the two ladies, three of us were like, man, that was great, beautiful. No, t the other, the guy comes out, he's like, man, my girl, I just learned everything. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, we, all we did was talk for the full hour. I'm like, oh my gosh, what, do you, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I started asking her where she was from and how many, I'm like, no, 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 no. See, you're using your words and now you're getting more information. Now you're inferring a relation, you wanna know. And, and then when she talked, he would learn knowledge about her. I didn't want any knowledge. I just want a massage. See here, what words do, they break open the thing, the relationship. And what John is saying is, don't you wanna know the mind of God? Well, I'll tell you what the mind of God wants to say. I'll tell you what, he, because of course he was invisible until Jesus. This is why he says at the end of the prologue in verse 18, if we ever get there, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side. He has made him known. Jesus Christ the Logos, he's, he's God's word opening up God to us. He, in the Greek verse 18, he exegeted God to us. It's like, uh, I was reading this story about this Sunday school teacher and he was talking about the idea that the audible words of a person are going to be the thing that let you know what they want out of you. John is saying, we were all a bit in a fog. We had the Old Testament and the Old Testament gave us a lot of ideas about what God wanted from humankind. But here, Jesus Christ is a new kind of revelation. 
He's the word. He preexisted. John 17, Jesus is praying to the father and he said, give me the glory that I had with you before the world began. So we know he preexisted. He also says in John 8 um, that before Abraham was, I am. And he kind of uses these. And, and people come along and they say, well, I, I don't understand why, G well, you know, I was at a coffee shop one time doing kind of a skeptics forum Q&A and, and someone raised their hand and they said, did Jesus Christ ever claim to be God? And of course, this is the, one of the deepest passages that's telling us exactly that he is God. And, and they say, but he, Jesus himself never said the words, I am God. And I said, that's true. A coffee shop full of people, everyone's like, like the mouths drop. And I'm like, no, 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 but there's a reason for that. The first reason is because in many ways, in new age philosophy, everyone's a God. So it wouldn't have been that unique for Jesus to say, I'm God. It's like, great, bro. Like take a number. You know, it's like, we're all gods. But secondly, what we got to understand is he did say it in exactly the way he wanted to say it to the people, to the cultural situation he was in. He made it clear through his words and deeds that he was God without even a little piece of room for debate, just made it clear as day to his culture, to the way that they thought, to the way that they would understand. And you see this all the way through the gospel of John. I'll give you an example. In chapter five, he's talking to this group of people and he's teaching them. It's one of the divine sermons in the gospel of John. And in verse 18 of John five, it says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Again, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witness, let them know that the text, it was very clear to the people. And this is why they wanted to kill him. He made it clear in exactly the way that they needed to hear it, that he was God. And yet it says that he was with God. And so he's God, but he's also with God. What does that mean? It means that he's not an independent entity. In fact, the Greek word for with here is, is not the normal Greek word for with. It's more of like this, it's the word pros. It's like this, uh, this intimate fellowship with God. And so on the one hand, he's gonna say in the gospel of John, I and the father are one, but the emphasis here is, but he's unique from the father. And he's gonna say the father is greater than I. That's in chapter 14. He says, the father is greater than I. So there's a distinction. Jesus is God, but he's also distinct from the fullness of God in the sense that the New Testament talks about father, son, Holy Spirit, right? This is why in Matthew's gospel, I want you to baptize them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. This is God. Three persons, eternally one, eternally distinct. And this is what John is alluding to and how he'll unpack his gospel as he goes. But here's what I love about all this. John here, I mean, look at this. He's going, uh, he was with God, right? Again, in the beginning, through him, all things were made. He's, he's the creator. See, a Jew would die for the theology of, of creational monotheism, meaning there's one God and he created everything. And John goes, let me tell you, let me crack that open for you. And the, the, the God that wouldn't share glory with anybody, all of a sudden shares glory with this one, the word. And what's beautiful about this is he's pulling, and this is what John does. He, he pulls the veil back. He opens up the curtain and goes, you know what you're seeing like on, a, on this level? Let me like, let me explain it to you. And that's why I'm gonna love spending the next year, whatever we're gonna be here uh, in the gospel of John, because he explains stuff. He opens, he pulls the veil back to reality. And he says, I know you're living your life and you see evil and you see pain and you see destruction. You feel it in your own soul. But let me tell you something. Things are not as they seem. I know the world looks like chaos, but there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's one who reigns. There's a God in control. And John does this all the time. He's not, he's not happy with, with, you know, we're coming up on Christmas, right? So John's not happy like Luke, just giving us the, the infancy narrative of Jesus that, the, that the, you know, the angels showed up and they kind of said, here's what's going on. Like that's, the, that's the, what you would see if you were, had, a, had a camera and you were watching it. John 
goes, what if I could like take you behind the meaning of it? Like, like the cosmic theological thing that was going on in the universe when he was being born. And he does it in, the, in a, another book that he wrote. John is the writer of the book of Revelation. The same guy who wrote the gospel wrote the book of Revelation. And here's what he writes in Revelation chapter 12. This is his Christmas story. You ready? All right, this is not the one anyone puts on a Christmas card. The Christmas card is the angels and the donkeys and the magi. And, okay, John goes, what was happening? Let me tell you what was happening. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his head, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars in heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who is about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. This is why it doesn't end up in the Christmas cards. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. See, John wants to tell you, you know, if you had a video camera, what you would have seen, you would have seen Herod killing babies trying to wipe out his competitor for Jewish messiahship. John tells you what was behind that act. There was a great red dragon who was trying to swallow and kill the Messiah himself. He pulls the veil back. This is what John does. This is why the gospel of John is so fun because it doesn't just tell us the what, it tells us why? What's, what's the meaning of this all? And so he tells us, Jesus, the Logos is God. So that blows away Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness theology. But he also tells us that he is with God. So he's distinct, which blows up the ideas of Judaism and Islam in a sense. There's unity and there's plurality in this God. He made all things He's the creator, Jesus. And then he says this, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. What you and I need, finally, John gets around to talking about us. We need a light to bring us life. See, our problem, look at what he says. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You know what our problem is? Our problem is not that we're dumb. Our problem is not that we, the problem with the world around us or in our own soul is not that we voted wrong as much as the media wants to tell us the, the ultimate plight of humankind is how you vote and what your ideology is. And this just said, that's not actually your problem. Your problem is you love darkness. It's not that you're dumb. It's that you're blind. It's that you can't see yet. You can't see the one who, who will show you what? Life, real like truly human, the, the word here is, is the word, it's the word zoe. Now there's another word he could have used. He could have used bios, which is like biological life. Instead, he uses zoe because he's trying to say a, a deeper kind of life, a truly human, meaningful existence is what Jesus Christ has come to offer you. What is he gonna say in chapter three? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever should believe in him 
will not perish but have everlasting what? Life. Zoe. I came to bring life and life abundant. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. See, what, he, what he's doing prologue is he's telling us where he's going. Every one of these themes is a little nugget that he's gonna just blow up for the next 21, just blow up and explain and how it has to be embraced by us or else it will be rejected by us and cause not life, but death, which is exactly the opportunity and option Jesus gives us in chapter five. And so he presents this Jesus to us. You know, he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. That this word is the light of all mankind. He's the light of men. Christianity is God lighting a candle and you don't light a candle in a room that's already full of sunlight. You light a candle in a room that is so dark and so murky that the candle when it is lit shows just how bad things really are. And he gives us this kind of hope and he says that he's the light of men and then those who believe in him are to be that, to, to carry on that light. Look at this. He's been all past tense up until this point. All of a sudden the light shines. Look at this word, the S in shines. That's present tense. He continues to shine now, today, in this world, to you. He shines continuously in the Greek. He shines, he's shining, he goes on shining he's now. For the first moment, he uses a present tense verb, not a past tense where he was telling you what happened and who someone was. He continues to do this thing you need. And then he inspires us to be what? John Stott talked about this years ago when Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You know, you're the city on a hill. John Stott says, stop looking around at the world. You don't blame darkness for being dark. You ask the question, where is the light? And so it filters down to you and me. If we're believers in Jesus, the question is, are we the light or are we? I mean, I, I look at Christians and it's like, are you shining in the darkness right now? Or are you just like mad at the darkness right now? Because you seem miserable to me. You seem just like, you know, it's a basic principle that moths are drawn to light. Bees are drawn to honey, not to mean-faced truth. Yes, of course, Jesus is true. And the gospel is true, but it's also good. Right? It's warm. It gives life. It has joy. Do you personify any of that in your life? The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This word, this in the Greek, it's a, it's a word, katalambano. It means to either suppress or to understand. So it, the, the darkness, the world has not, uh, has not suppressed the light Jesus or the gospel, but it also has not necessarily understood it because our life blinds our minds to embracing who Jesus is and what he's done. And that's the question it leaves with us. Has it been suppressed or misunderstood by you? To this point, he gives you an opportunity to stop suppressing to move away from not understanding to understanding it fully and knowing him fully. So John introduces us to the one who can create light from darkness. Because some of you think, man, you don't know my life. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I did yesterday. You don't know what I did 15 minutes before I started. Why? You don't know who I am. This is the beautiful thing John wants to say. 
however dark you are, the light is more powerful. You cannot suppress it if you open yourself to it. And so, Father, let us embrace the truth that John begins this amazing book with. And let us have the courage to receive it because you are, to everyone watching this and listening to my voice right now, you are sitting there with life in the palm of your hand saying, come on, take it. Life. In the midst of the darkness of your life, the isolation, the pain, the loneliness, the big question, I'm I'm offering you life. Life to the full, zoe, not bias, zoe. Eternal life. Take it. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would. And as we respond and as we worship you, that you would start producing life even in this moment. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.